Greetings, everybody. Thank you for listening. This is Hear Her Sports, and I'm Elizabeth Emery. Before we get started, a bit of housekeeping. Hear Her Sports is taking off the month of August, but don't fear, there's plenty of new, inspiring conversations to listen to during that time. Last week, I launched Hear Her Sports Glenville, presented by the Cleveland YWCA for Front International. Hear Her Sports Glenville is a neighborhood stories project about the power of sports for girls and women, breaking barriers and reaching goals. Yes, Glenville is a Cleveland neighborhood, but the stories are not just about Cleveland. For example, I talked to teenagers working towards college scholarships and seniors finding community and better health at a local recreation center. I'd love it if you follow along on Instagram at hearherglenville, where each day there will be a new daily quote to introduce some of the women and girls participating in the project. There are also photos and some teasers. The 20 minute episodes are available on iTunes, Spotify, and your favorite podcast player, and directly from the website, hearhersportsproject.com. Of course, August is also a great time to catch up on Hear Her Sports episodes that you've missed. I still often think of Shelma Jun in episode 27, or listen to Megan Jastrob in episode 18. She has been on fire this season during a spring trip to Europe and at junior track nationals, where she just won five titles and set a national record. Now on to this week's episode. I'm so excited to introduce Iris Slappendell, a founder of the Cyclist Alliance, a new women's cycling union. There are two parts to the episode because I spoke to her just as the organization launched and then again a couple of weeks ago. It's great to hear her goals and then about successes and what they've learned over the past six months. This is such an important organization with very big plans. As Iris mentions, Women's cycling is at a great moment right now. There are tons happening to make the sport better. As we speak, 12 women from Team Donon des Ailes au Velo are riding the entire Tour de France route one day ahead of the professional men's peloton. They are doing that to promote the idea of a real Tour de France for women. Well, let's get going and hear more from Iris. Today's guest is Iris Slapendel, a founder and the executive director of the Cyclist Alliance. The Cyclist Alliance is a new women's cycling union. I'm so excited to talk to her about all the changes and growth in women's cycling. Welcome, Iris. It's a real honor and a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Could you start by giving an overview of this new union and of where women's cycling is right now? Yes, I can. Um, so maybe start with where is women cycling right now, because that that's the reason we've we've created this union. So I think women cycling is a sport that's rapidly growing in the last few years. Um, the level raised, it's becoming more and more professional, and the teams are becoming more professional. And I think what is the best is that the races are getting really more exciting. So there is not just one racer who can who can win a race. There are like 10 or 20 racers, riders who can win a race. And that makes it very exciting to watch. Like if you're a fan of women's cycling, but if you've watched the past few years, the World Championships, for example, it's it's been all like really exciting races. So I think that's... One of the reasons we've started the alliance because although it's going well, women's professional cycling, we believe, is on the verge of becoming one of the fastest growing women's sport and also commercially uh, lucrative. And to encourage that process, I think it's good for, for women to have an active part in that progress. And uh, therefore, you, you need to create some some way that you stand together that you have a uh, uh, unite the voice your voice and I think that's the only way to talk with other stakeholders like the teams or the UCI the, the International Cycling Union or with the race organizers about how how we're gonna improve women's cycling and how the women can help and can be part of it it's an important catalyst to push all those stakeholders. And uh, I think, and I have to say, we think, we believe as a, as founders that uh, without an association, the economics of the sport will remain small and in control of the hands of just a few people. And that will limit the opportunity for uh, women's racing today and in the future. 
like the most important part of a sport is the players are the riders you know without without the riders there's no there's no women cycling and i think that's why it's important to make your voice heard and that's that can only be done that's only easier if you all stand together so women cycling is really in a in a positive flow like it it is really improving but there's still many things that are not uh, well at the moment not not good for the riders and yeah i think more or less that that's the that's the reason so to be part of that positive mo- movement to to be a, an active stakeholder and um to to have your voice heard right what is the alliance doing and how are they doing that that's a big question <laughs> uh, yeah so for for my background I, w- I was a professional cyclist for 12 years and i was also part of the um, athletes commission within the international cycling union and you know myself as a rider i had some questions and i have some struggles sometimes you know when you have problems with your contract or your team manager or that whatever and um at the same time, being the at least representative, I got similar questions from riders. So, I mean, it's clear that, that there are a lot of things that are not not done right and that the riders have a big ask for help when it comes to legal advice or, um, yeah, that, that kind of things. But to be sure, we've started out uh, in February 2017 with a survey we sent it out to all the UCI riders, um, over 400, 50% responded. And already the fact that so many riders responded is, um, uh, yeah, is, is a clear sign that they really want and, and they're really looking for help and someone who helps them with uh, expressing their voice. And I, maybe coming back to your first question, that is, I think that should maybe be the most important thing. Why now? Because the riders want want it. They want someone, uh, some organization to to express their uh, voice and to help them. So, yeah. Let me interrupt for one second. So the riders that you sent this to and that you're representing are road or all women cycling in all the disciplines? No, they're specifically a road cyclist. Okay. And so they're all part of a UCI women's team. Got it. Okay. Thanks. And um, so, yeah, so we started out with a survey. From that survey, we, um, yeah, we wrote down like the main objectives or goals that the riders ask for or what came out of the survey. And uh, based on that mission and objective, we made a, a long term plan. And that's like in the first year, for sure, we will make sure this association is established and that we have a seat in uh, multiple uh, UCI um, commissions. We support riders with legal advice and we have um, a new standard contract for the members that they can use already when they sign a new contract with their team. Um, and that's because, for example, we saw there are, there are a lot of things written in contracts that are, shouldn't be in there. And at the same time, almost no rider has a manager and almost no rider really understands what they sign when they sign a contract with the team. So it's like this this small, already this small part of education will improve their uh, situation. And then in the coming years, we're working, for example, on a mentorship program, uh, in, on an insurance uh, package, representation on... Um, other organizations like the Professional Cycling Council or the CPA. And I think the most important thing that we were working on is to, to, to push for a teams association. And then we can negotiate with the teams association for a, a joint agreement or like minimum working conditions. And I think that would be really huge. That's our that's our goal to have something like that established in the second year and and that's a thing like it, if we can establish a, jo- a joint agreement then yeah you can rapidly improve the working conditions of the riders that's really some specific things that we can help the riders with 
And with the working conditions, are you mostly talking about salary or are you talking about like on the job conditions? Both. So there is no minimum salary at the moment in women's cycling. So if the riders and the teams can negotiate a minimum salary, I think that would be a huge improvement. But at the moment, I think that women's cycling is not... It, it, it is not it, economically it's not possible for all teams to provide a minimum salary and also you don't want to kill your sport at the same time but maybe with the top 10 teams that will be part of the um, women's world tour uh, next year it, it's possible but i think and on that that's also something that came out of the survey it's way more important for the riders to have for example professional staff members so speaking about team managers, uh, sport directors with with an education for a sport director, uh, mechanics and soigneurs who are educated as a, as a mechanic or a soigneur. You know, that is not someone's dad or someone's boyfriend who is, who is fixing your bike or massaging the whole team. So that is something that's, that's, that's very important. And secondly, uh, the equipment, uh, traveling, medical expenses, yeah, those kind of things, uh, insurance, um, it, that is just not a normal thing for, for all riders, for all teams. And I think to have um, a more equal, I think it's, it's, we shouldn't look too much, for example, to, to men cycling, but first try to make uh, women cycling more equal. So now we have some riders that are very well paid, and like the top riders, they race every weekend against girls who ha- have no salary from the team, who still have a second job, who drive by themselves five, six hundred kilometer to a race, or um, you know, they 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 don't stay in hotels. Yeah, we have to create an equal playing field, and and those minimum working conditions are way more important than uh, a minimum salary. I think it's interesting, though, because, you know, on on one hand, I agree with what you said. On the other hand, you know, if you give riders a minimum salary, then they can quit their job, then they can become more fit, then the peloton is deeper and the racing gets better and there's more interest. And I mean, it's like this cascade of what happens just by having a minimum salary for everybody. Yeah, that's true. But uh, there is a danger because if you say, okay, we you have to provide a minimum salary to a team that doesn't have the the budget to provide a minimum salary, they will always create some constructions that the riders have to pay for other things or they have to pay back their salary or, you know, you get all this dodgy stuff going on on the on the background and you see that riders, they are so keen to be part of a UCI team that that they sign the most shitty contracts. Right, right. Uh, and, you know, at, at some point, I I feel you almost have to protect riders from themselves, from from signing for those kind of, uh, of teams that definitely don't have the best interest with their riders. I do agree with you that if you set a minimum salary, there is the opportunity for a more equal playing field, but also more equal teams. So some teams will... Uh, disappear because they can't afford it but maybe that are the teams that you know that are actually not that actually they don't have the level to be a world tour team right in in 2019 the plan of the uci is to to introduce a two-tier system and then you could say for example okay this tier one teams they have to provide a minimum salary the tier two teams They can be recognized, for example, more as development teams and they don't have to provide a minimum salary. But I would love to see that they would provide other, you know, other things like, for example, professional staff or the opportunity for education or, you know, those kind of good insurance, those kind of things. Right. I want to go back to something that you mentioned about, like, how do you save, how do you save riders from themselves? for signing those crappy contracts, because I think that's a a really difficult thing because, you know, you've put all this effort into training and you want to get on a team and then, but you're sort of perpetual, you know, riders who sign those terrible contracts are just perpetuating the bad contracts. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it, it's a, it, it's a really difficult thing. You know, I think education is very important. So they have to know what they really sign for, what they should, what they should expect from a team, and what is definitely uh, not not right. If it, you know, what what other things that are happening at teams. Um, and I think it's also kind of to make them conscious that, you know, there is there is a um, yeah, it, it's their own choice at the end. But they sort of kill their own sport by by keep signing with bad teams and racing for them. And I hope we can change that way of thinking through the Cyclist Alliance that at least when you speak about it and you can say, hey, this is not normal what's happening in your team, that riders are aware of it and they know, okay, this team is not a, a good team to sign for. At least, you know, when they are when they can ask me or some of the other board members before they sign with a team and we can say, okay, you can sign with this team, but in the past few years, this happens and this happened and this happened. So it's probably not a good idea to sign for that team. Then when they would still sign for it at the end because they so badly want a, a contract, and then it's more or less their own choice. But now there's some kind of culture that when something bad happens in a team, a rider just by the end of the year moves to another team and no one speaks about it. So, yeah, then you sort of keep this culture alive because it's, um, yeah, it, it's, um, it's something people don't speak about. So I think being open about it and educate and make them aware and also I hope this mentorship program can really help that you connect an experienced rider to a uh, to young rider and the young rider can be teached by the by the older rider uh, what's you know what is it not only what it takes to to be a professional cyclist but also all the things around like um, when it comes to um, to team ethics. Right. And, you know, I, th I think what's interesting is that you're asking riders to take the leap of having to think of the sport as a whole rather than just their individuality. And I think from the outside perspective, that's what's different about this cyclist alliance than what I've seen in the past, in that you and Carmen are done racing so that you can proceed without fear of um, yeah. retribution. Yeah. And I think that's 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 huge. Yeah, I I hope so. I, I think it's um, for sure it's easier for us now to talk to talk about it. You know, when yeah, like you say, there is not there is no team that that will say, "Hey, Iris, I I don't sign you next year because uh, you know you're you're a difficult rider because you talk about all this." Right, right. With everyone, you can be the bad guys. Yeah, yeah. That's and and you know I. I would love to be the bad guy. I don't mind. <laughs> and, you know, and I also, because we are also speaking with with team managers and there are many team managers who also want, want to change the situation. So I think we're not a threat to any team or to any race organizer. I think everyone who has the right intention to improve women's cycling. And at the end, if we can change the economics of women's cycling, we, we will all profit, the riders and the teams uh, and the race organizers. So, yeah, if you have the right intentions, then I think everyone can be happy with uh, what, what we've been uh, establishing here. And who who doesn't, I think, well, maybe then it's better if they, they leave the sport because, yeah, w why are you in uh, women's cycling if, if you're just doing it for, I don't know, your own bank account or that you love to be in charge over a bunch of uh, women. I don't, I don't, I don't know <laughs> what, what the motives are. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what are, what are the barriers that you're facing? Um, at the moment, I'm actually really surprised that there are not so many barriers. I think the biggest barrier is to really educate people about our plans and, I think our concept is, like you say, it's it's different than what's been done before. So we really have to educate also the riders, of course, but also the, the teams on our plans, but also the UCI. As soon as we 
explain it. Most people are like super enthusiastic about it, but um, uh, yeah, that takes a lot of time. So I think a barrier is that uh, that it's something new and it needs some some time to um, that everyone really understands where we want to go. But like the UCI responded quite. Um, yeah, um, maybe I wouldn't say enthusiastic, but yeah, they were they were very positive about uh, what we were setting up. We we were already speaking with some team managers, so yeah. For now, I think I don't really see any barriers. Yeah, just some practical stuff. That that's great. Let's talk a little bit about the UCI. So you've spoken with them. Yeah, we had a meeting with uh, La Partiente, the new um, president of the UCI, in uh, early December. Um, it's, it's a bit, um, difficult. Like the last few years I was in the athletes commission and also in the road commission, which is, uh, a, a quite important commission in, uh, within the UCI when it comes to road cycling. So I've always been working with Brian Cookson. So I knew him, uh, I think quite well. He was pretty open for the thing we were doing for women's cycling and now there's a new president, so you need to build on a new relationship. Sure. But yeah, I'm actually quite surprised or pleasantly surprised about his reaction. And I think, yeah, we're on the same page that uh, I, I think David Lapertient sees that in men's cycling, there is not much to gain for him there. If you really want to make a change in your sport in within cycling, then you can do that with women cycling. It's it's a blank sheet. You can create a whole new sport. You can do everything what's been done wrong with men cycling. You can do it right now with women cycling. And that is the opportunity for the UCI. And um, I think they see that opportunity. And it's to us to to help them to achieve that, to make the change uh, and to push them maybe a little bit harder that it so it goes a little bit faster than most things uh, happen at the UCI. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I mean, everything you're saying sounds so optimistic, but I've seen a lot of lethargy or, you know, Cookson was quoted in, in the movie, Half the Road, you know, like it's a gigantic ship, it's hard to turn. And I just, oh my God, I just, I've, I'm tired of hearing that. Yeah, well, because women cycling is not, it's not a, okay, maybe men cycling. Yeah, it's hard to turn because there are so many stakeholders and there there is already so much established but in women's cycling it's not it's just a yeah it's i think it's a very fresh sport and you can you can take it every direction and it's it's uh and we want to push it the right direction and i hope the uci you know is is, is part of that and will support or we support the uci it, you know it doesn't matter who takes uh, the lead? But yeah, I've, uh, you know, now we're discussing our plans with the UCI, and um, you know, Tracy Godry is is uh, is an important person in in that as well. But she's, she's no longer a, one of the vice presidents, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a shame. Yeah. Um, and there's also I I noticed there's no women in the there's certainly no women in the top four and Tracy is the only woman on the 17 person management committee. So that too is a shame. Yeah, that's really a shame. Yeah. I think the UCI is quite a big ship. That's uh, a <laughs> hard um, Yeah. You know, it's politics. Uh, I'm not a big fan of politics. I just say what I think. And uh, yeah, I hope that will, I mean, it, it, it's something that that's hard to change. And um at the end, it's hard to change, but I, I, sorry to interrupt. But I mean, the other thing that I keep wanting to ask is, is, you know, like somebody just needs to make a decision and make it happen. True. You know, I'm oversimplifying. I know that. But at a certain point, somebody has just got to make the decision and, you know, accept the responsibility for what happens. That's true. And and I think and what I was saying that you don't really need the UCI to do that. Mm. I you know, the UCI is an important stakeholder, uh, but they are, at the end, they're also just a regulator. So if the teams and the, and the riders, for example, can come to an agreement about the working conditions or a minimum salary, you don't need an, a UCI to do that. Actually, that's totally not up to the UCI. Oh, you I didn't can't, know that. No, 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 that's, that's not the responsibility of the UCI. 
you don't need the UCI to create, I don't know, for example, your own league, like what I have been with tennis in the past, or to connect your a league that you create with an online platform or a broadcaster or, you know, to some kind of a new digital media outlet. So, yeah, th- that's... Um, yeah, I'm still super positive. I've been- yeah, I'm super encouraged just hearing that. That's awesome. Yeah. Can we go back and talk a little bit about some of the statistics that you learned from the survey? Like, what is the salary range for women road cyclists? Um, well, the the survey we did was between no salary or 40,000 uh, euros a year. But we saw from the survey that half of the peloton is, is earning less than 10,000 euros a year. And 47% is earning less than 5,000 euros a year. So you can say that actually half of the riders has no salary. Right. And then there's like a small percentage that earns over 20,000 euros a year, I think 17%. And that's like the minimum income in the Netherlands, for example. Okay. And what do the top team leaders make and what do the top domestiques make? Well, I think the, um, the top leaders make around, yeah, f- between 40,000 and... Yeah, I think there are just one or two or three girls maybe that make 100,000 a year. Got it. And then the top domestiques make around 20,000. You, you can check it all on, on, the, on the website. Okay, will do. I guess I was interested in, you know, like the numbers of people who are actually making a living. Yeah. Yeah, well, then if you would say 20,000 is a living... Then um, then I have to calculate fast, and it's like 35% of the peloton, so that's like um, 100 riders, maybe. Yeah. So it sounded like you said that the peloton has been reacting really well to what you guys are doing. Has there been any resistance from any of the riders? And what has that resistance been? No, there's not been any resistance actually that uh, that I that I've heard of. Just a few said that they're like, hey, because they have to pay a membership fee of fifty euros a year. That's maybe uh, um, for some riders a reason not to sign up yet, or not yet. Maybe hopefully later. That's the only thing. But in general, they they're all really positive about it. Yeah. One of the articles that I read on your website talked about the difference between men's sports and women's sports and how women, you know, take in sports or consume sports. And I was wondering if you personally thought about how women do consume sports or watch sports or relate to sports and the athletes. I often wonder if women are interested in sports in a way that's that's different from men or if they are consuming sports in a way that's different from men because that's the kind of stories that they've been given. No, I think I think they're really consuming sports in a different way. If I, for example, when you talk about cycling, when you know I ride a lot with with male cyclists. Of course, I've always trained a lot with guys. I always feel like the men are more interested in the winners, like in the heroes, and it doesn't matter if it's a really uh, boring guy without any personality <laughs> if he won a race. Well, I'm always more interested in someone's personality or someone's, um, yeah, what, you know, what, what kind of, what kind of person it is. Maybe women also search more for that background of an athlete. Right. They're maybe less interested in the, in the winner. What do you, what do you think? I personally am not interested in sort of the blow by blow what happened in a race. I get very bored. Yeah, <laughs> it, It's too sort of egocentric to me. However, on the other hand, I never liked the NBC Olympic coverage from many years ago. They had those up close and personal yeah. interviews and they were just they were so far removed from the sport that it was no longer interesting to me either. So I think there's a balance somewhere. Yeah, yeah, of course there is a b- balance, but 
I think as a woman, more you try more to identify maybe with an with an athlete, and and it's easier to identify with with someone who has, for example, a mutual hobby or background, or and it doesn't necessarily have to be the winner. I mean, I love uh, Serena Williams because I, I don't, I'm not a fan of tennis, but I like her because I think it's. She's cool and she's like out, very outspoken. Something I, I I really like, and she has her own fashion brand. <laughs> something I really like. So then I think, yeah, it's a pretty cool chick. So she became a mom while also try to still be a, a pro a pro player. So yeah, I think that's that's someone something that inspires me. You know, that more than I don't know how many Grand Slams uh, she won. Well, it's certainly an opportunity for the sponsors, you know, that you don't have to worry about the people that you're interested in winning. You know, they can just be interesting, really good, motivational people. Yeah, that's, that's, that, I think so too. And, I, and some brands already use that quite smart. And I think that, that's an opportunity for the future to use women's cycling, to get those personalities and to, those stories out there. And um I mean, women are also very easy to reach, to get in contact with. I I was part of a cycling team that had a a men's team and a women's team. And I think quite soon they saw that it was way better to invite the women to a sponsor meeting than the men because the women were much more engaging with the sponsors, with the guests. The easier share their knowledge or experience or they were just maybe more social I don't know but that is something that you can give back as a as an athlete is maybe much more valuable for a a sponsor than just those victories do you think that that will change with increased money in the sport like will women all all of a sudden be aloof because they're making more money no I don't think so no I don't think so either no no, that's not no I've always enjoyed it as well so Do you have long-term goals that we haven't discussed already? Uh, yeah. I think a long-term goal is that um, what I think is very important is to um, to reach those new audience and to establish a true women's uh, league, a racing league. The best would be to have full sustainability as a global women's sporting union eh, for for ourselves for the cyclist alliance with multiple sources and with broadcasting agreements you know um we have good relationships with all the stakeholders and to really influence the the sport and um that that's a goal for for the cyclist alliance for women's cycling the goal is yeah the same actually to make it a a sustainable economic uh, sustainable sport and to be more global to reach out to new fans uh, to have all the riders you know to be a truly professional not that they only feel they're a professional but they are really a professional Um, and I also really hope that we can establish this uh, mentorship program with a chance for education for after career support um, with maybe a pension plan that would be yeah very important for this was something that came out of the survey as well the, the riders are very concerned about their future so um, yeah this this after career support is uh, is a big thing we're we're working on and and hopefully we can establish that in the in the future or near future even better yeah, that's so smart to think about what's next. Yeah, well, but there are very smart riders, so that it's a, it's a really smart peloton. If you look to the uh, numbers of how many riders have a higher education at the moment, that's really amazing. So, yeah, it's a smart bunch of uh, women, and 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 they are concerned about their future. So, it's great if we can help them right. uh, uh, with that. What are your goals for media coverage? Of, of women's cycling um so so we're, we're now speaking with possible or looking for different opportunities and i think that comes really together with 
a more exciting women's calendar. And I think the the goal is to have a more modern format for delivery over free-to-air TV and digital on-demand platforms. And uh, to create that fan experience where we just talked about that you can build a connection through those personal stories. But yeah, to get the racing out there and to make new fans and to get the riders uh, known. So yeah, coming back to the goal, uh, how to reach that is create that the race series or at least that that's something we hopefully can do together with the UCI that you really create a a narrative a story for uh, a series of racing I mean we have a series of racing we have the world tour but you can tell the story better and uh, bring that to a more modern format of uh, of of media delivery I think we can be an important um, organization to to push for that to to we have quite a quite a few connections within our um, association at the moment and and we are already working on that so oh you're working hope... directly with media companies yeah Great. yeah well Great. we're trying to there's no scoop or something it's there's nothing uh there's nothing arranged yet but uh yeah we're working with our business plan uh with some advisors on pos- different possibilities so um yeah cool i think cool. that that's a that's a realistic uh, goal so who who are your heroes? You mentioned tennis. Is Billie Jean a, a hero? Uh, yeah, she's she's definitely a, a good role model. I, I would say. Um, who who's a, my hero? You know, I get inspiration from so many things. Like what happened last uh, summer in in the United States with the hockey players. I think that's the kind of things that are really inspiring when I just saw this evening the the speech of uh, Oprah Winfrey I think oh yeah that you know there's just so many things going on in women's sports or when it comes to um, uh, equality that are all things that that uh, inspire me I can mention one hero but uh, there I think maybe maybe the, the women's peloton is my hero there are so many great writers in there who I think deserve, you know, a good treatment and a good career, and uh, and especially uh, they deserve a future with their sport. I think that's the best motivation. Yeah. Are you riding? Are you still riding yourself? Uh, yeah. Well, it's it's a little bit busy at the moment. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm I'm, st- I'm still uh, riding once in a while. Yeah. What's your favorite breakfast? My favorite, oh yeah, I'm, I'm really boring with breakfast. Uh, for the last 20 years, I have the same breakfast. So it's just fruit and yogurt and, and muesli. I guess that's my favorite. I've decided that most athletes eat some version of oatmeal every day. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> when, when I put some mango in, then, uh, then it's a real treat. So. <laughs> and what about favorite food? Do you have a favorite food? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, Dutch food, of course. Well, not of course, but uh, you, you know. I've... What's Dutch food? Um, yeah, what's Dutch food is <laughs> is a difficult to explain, but it's mostly potatoes and vegetables all mashed together, like a big vegetable mashed up plate. <laughs> It doesn't really look very attractive, but it tastes <laughs> very good. And uh, I'm, I'm, I, I love to eat uh, red beets. Oh, I like red yeah. beets. Yeah. Well, is, we're wrapping things up. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you want to talk about? Well, first of all, it's it's important to say that it's not just me, this uh, Cyclist Alliance, but it's the uh, it's also Carmen Small and Gracie Alvin, and we have a a great uh, group of advisors. For example, with Mariana Foss. And some, you know, many advisors who have their own specialty were connected already to some bigger player unions like the Uni World Players Association and EU athletes who are very uh, helpful. And um, so it's not just me, uh, not at all. Um, And what else I want to add? No, I think I'm happy with with all the attention we get, and it's great you 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 tell me all the, those questions and uh, and you know anyone who has IDs or want to support somehow or 
wants to make some remarks or has more questions, they're always welcome to uh, to contact us. And um, yeah, that's that's it. I think, um, like Carmen said, this can be a, and I really believe so. This can be a changing point for for the sport of women cycling and. And hopefully we will become one of the biggest sport in women's sports. That would be uh, great. And I think also realistic. All right. That was Iris from early January of this year. Our second call was just a couple of weeks ago. And we talked about everything that has happened in the last six months. If you would like to contact Iris, head to her episode page on hearhersports.com for links to reach her. Thank you so much, Iris, for coming back. It's been a while, actually, when I was looking at the Skype. It's been six months since our first conversation. So (laughs) it's been a long time. So what's been happening with the Alliance since we last spoke? Um, Quite a lot, I think. So if it's six months ago that we spoke, that's when we just started uh, officially. Uh, And yeah, I think the last six months were quite... um, I have to say it's been it's been really great. It's been overwhelming, but it's it's also worrying because yeah, there's definitely a need for a union that helps the riders. So, I mean, we all knew there was an an ask for it, but uh yeah, the fact that uh, there is quite a lot of riders reaching out to us is also, you know, it's 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 not not always a good thing. Uh because of the situation the riders are in. So, but yeah, I think I think in the six months we made quite a lot of progress, but it's also been a learning experience because now since we've really started, we've also noticed like oh all the work it involves and there there were a lot of quite some things that came up that we didn't really n- knew before. Like I what? mean um I guess the complications of cases sometimes, but also I think what surprises me the most is that uh, it's still so hard for riders to, uh, I mean, they come to us with with a complaint or a question or for help, and then we provide an answer or we say, okay, you can do this or that or go to, we can, we can help you to file a complaint at the UCI or we can... We can write an email to your team manager, but always when it comes to that kind of point, there are many riders who hold back and who say like, okay, no, no, thanks. Um, we don't want to proceed because, you know, they're, they're afraid for results of that kind of action. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that that's, um, I think this is a process that's, sl- we need to have some successes to show the riders that, yeah, they're they're more they're in a more stronger position than they think, and uh, that will give them some confidence. But uh, up until now, there are many riders who who still think that all the power is with the teams or with the UCI or you right. know whoever. Yeah, you know that reminds me of a situation that I was in. This is like you know many many years ago. But I got criticized by the team, and I would say that I was not supported by the other riders. So I understand riders' concern. Yeah. You know, it's like the US, women's U.S. hockey team. What made them successful was that every single woman hockey yeah. player in the country banded together. True. That's exactly it. So we did help some riders from teams, but they, they really need to realize that, okay, if we do this all together, then then we're going to achieve something. But, you know, at the end, we cannot force a rider to to do something, to file a complaint or to go to arbitrage. We can just support them and explain them what their rights are and help them and even, you know, start a process for them. But it, it, it is the rider who, I mean, they have to agree on it. And, and it's it's apparently still a very scary thing for, for riders to do. And, and yes, that is understandable, but... I really hope this will change in the future because in in this way, then, you know, at the end, nothing will change if we, yeah. Right. I mean, another concern that I would have is that it would sort of derail your season. Like, let's say you have a complaint, you file it, and then all of a sudden your entire season is focused on this complaint and the arbitrage. So is is that an actual concern? Yeah, that is a concern because like quite a big part of the complaints that, that come in have to do with team ethics. 
So it's intimidation or um, uh, mental abuse or riders are being forced to do stuff that they don't feel comfortable with. And, and in this kind of case, when we, you know, the rider should go to the ethics commission at the UCI, but this, you can do that anonymously. So if you file a complaint, for example, against your uh, sport director or your team manager, the complaint will be immediately sent forward to that person. So he can, uh, he or she can um, have, an, have an answer on that. And I mean, if you do that in, in April or March, every rider will know that if they have the courage to go to the ethics commission, for sure, for sure, they won't be racing anymore the rest of the season. Right. Because, uh, yeah. And, and at the end, every rider just wants to race. We had two cases that the rider says, OK, I don't care anymore if I'm being put out of the team or if I don't race anymore. My life's so miserable right now. I take the I take the gamble. But for most riders, it's still more important to race than to make a complaint. So, yeah. And, and we really pushed and asked the UCI multiple times, like, Please, can you make an like uh, anonymous, an ombudsman, or I don't know what the word is in English, but like a person you can go to and you can you can complain, and they and your complaint stays anonymous. But um, yeah, right. Until now, that's not that's not something that they. I mean, they're talking about it, but uh, they haven't installed something like that yet. So I think this, you know. This ethics commission thing is okay. It's good. It's there, but I don't think it really works for for a lot of riders. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm encouraged that it, it certainly sounds like the riders are taking advantage of your services. Yeah, I mean, I think until now we helped up around eight to ten riders, and a few times this rider presented like also her teammates. So I think we've helped quite a lot of. Riders and very often it's it's quite simple. Like for example, there's a rider that doesn't get paid anymore because she's been sick for one or two months, and her team manager says, "Okay, we don't pay you anymore because you're sick." And she comes to us and she say, "Hey, is that actually possible?" And then yeah, of course we say, "No, that's not possible." <laughs> so we show the UCI regulations and we look at her contract, and you know even in Actually, in some contracts, it's written that you don't get paid anymore if you're sick. But in in most contracts, it isn't. And then, you know, just showing that to her team manager makes that she gets paid again. Because the team managers, they realize like, oh, okay, probably she has some kind of support or she knows the rules. So we cannot fool around with this kind of stuff. I think, you know, we That's excellent. most of it. Yeah, most of the times you don't have to go to arbitrage or to get something done it's just uh you know showing the riders what her rights are and helping her to show that to her team manager and this is you know has been done with already with a rider who would be fired for no reason or not getting paid or yeah we had some small success and i think this is definitely important also riders that got asked to sign contracts about equipment that were undermining their actual contract, and we ju- and they asked us, "Hey, should we sign this?" And we said, "No, don't sign it because it undermines your your actual contract." And no one signed it. And at the end, you know, uh, yeah, they could still use the equipment. So right. Well, you know, the, the thing that I like about that is that it's also showing the team management that you know the riders are now going to be assertive. Exactly. It's a small thing. And this is something we've said from the beginning. It's a small thing that can make a big difference to give the riders the education of what their rights are and and that they have support. Yeah. I I interrupted you um, as you were telling me, you know, what's been happening since we last spoke. Is there anything else? (laughs) Yeah. Um, So coming to these these, uh, ethical conditions, Safety within teams, but also within races, but especially within teams, has been one of the biggest concerns from the riders that came out of the the survey that we did uh, in 2017. And and this has been one of our main objectives. What do you mean by safety? So um, that the working environment is a safe place so that you know that 
the team staffing is well educated for the job they do and if they breach the the ethics code for example that they can also be prosecuted or <laughs> i don't know what the word at least they can be held accountable for their deeds and this is something like i said before we asked the UCI to to install some kind of ombudsman they haven't done that but at least they they just presented a new code of conduct that's going to be um they will enforce that in 2019 and it has to be signed by all employees of a UCI women's team. And it's a code of conduct that states very clearly like, okay, this is what I can and can do working for a team. I think there's two things. It will raise awareness of harassment that some riders uh, still face, but it will also give the rider even more support and confidence that Whenever someone in your team staff does not respect this code of conduct, it will result into sanctions. So I think, you know, it's just a little bit of that extra support of, you know, what what can and can be done in a professional sporting environment. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's say it like that. Mm-hmm. Another thing is insurance, which was also a big priority for riders. Um there are regulations now on which insurance a team should provide and which ones the rider herself should provide, but it's very unclear. And we did have already quite a lot of questions about it this year. And when we talk with uh, national federations, it's a little bit like a gray area. And that results into that some riders are underinsured. This is health insurance, right? Yeah, this is health insurance. Yeah. So the regulations will be stronger and also more clear on that for next year. And we also provide insurance package now, right now already for the riders together with an insurance company in Germany that provides already insurance packages for a lot of bigger teams. Wow, that's great. That's a great offering. So, uh, yeah, so that the riders can buy that package for a reduced price because they're a member of us. Yeah, you know, at the end, we 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 want that every rider has the full support from her team. But right now, I think this is the second best option. At least, you know, the most important is, I think, for riders also to understand that, you know, it's it's a pretty dangerous sport. So, yeah, your insurance is, is super important. I would think that just making it easy for them to get insurance at a reduced price True. would be really and, helpful. And all... And, and also, it's important that they get an insurance that's very focused on on the rider as a professional cyclist. I think it, of course, huh. it provides a bit more... Crash insurance. Uh, yes, <laughs> for example. <laughs> <laughs> Dental insurance, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's two things. And I, uh, something else, that, that what we've done in the last few months is that we, we launched the mentorship program. We've talked about it last winter. That, that's that been our plan from the beginning. And I think two months ago, we've, we've started it. And the mentorship program is we, we match an experienced rider with a young rider from different countries and different teams. And we had sort of like, let's say, uh, a soft lounge. <laughs> but we've already got, I think, six or seven couples right now. We're still working on a, um, on a, on an online platform that we can provide also some extra things for for the mentors and the mentees. But for now, there we we match them. And this has been done like on a, on a questionnaire and to see like where are their interests and, you know, what kind of types of riders are they. And they just communicate with each other by WhatsApp or calling or in speaking with each other in the race. And we help the mentors or the mentees, but mostly the mentors, if they have any question about the mentoring or Mm -hmm. the coaching and um yeah we get really good feedback on that so that's definitely what we want to uh, keep building on and i think it's also this is actually a very simple thing it's just connecting people but it's it's very valuable for the riders and also the mentors they really enjoy sharing their experiences so um yeah i would think it would also help 
sort of, you know, more open conversation about the issues that you're talking about and wanting to work on so that there's just greater communication. Yeah, it's true. And what I personally very often experienced as a writer, it's that it's sometimes difficult to talk about issues like uh, salary or um, even the way your team manager behaves in the team or Sometimes you're in a team and you think yourself like, hmm, is this normal? <laughs> and all your teammates pretend like it's normal. So you right. don't really want to ask it, especially when you're when you're young. And then it's easier to, you know, I always had that kind of person myself when I was a writer, sort of like a mentor. And, uh, and that really helped me that, that I could just call her sometimes. And I said like, hey... You know, is this is this normal? E- even about your own teammates, you know, it's it's something you can prepare for being a pro cyclist. So right. when you're 18 or 19 and you and you step into this weird world of <laughs> pro athletes and cycling races and everything, it's uh, yeah. Cool. That's great. Uh, so what are your days like? You mentioned that it's been overwhelming. So my first thought was like, how many hours are you working and what are you doing every day? Yeah, well, I still have, um, I used to say, three normal jobs. No, you <laughs> so, don't. Oh, no. <laughs> so this is just uh, for for Gracie, Carmen and me. This is all like uh, voluntary work we do. How about and that? And it's most of the times we do it in, in evenings or early mornings or, you know, a lot of stuff. I just squeeze in between my other work. I'm uh, self-employed, so I'm pretty flexible in my times. But yeah, it's, it's quite... Um, I think I spend 10 to 15 hours a week working for the Cyclist Alliance. So it's, yeah, it's quite a lot next to all all the no- normal work. But um, you're a designer, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. I remember yeah. that from last time. So what have the biggest struggles been for you in the last six months or year even? Well, actually, the, the finance or let's say the resources, that's quite of a struggle because we just do everything now from the membership fees and um yeah that's not a lot so um yeah we actually don't have any resources so you know we try to make not too much cost but of course we you know sometimes i have to fly somewhere for meetings or um yeah you just have like administrational costs uh, or the website and actually you know it would be good if we have some resources to to hire also some expertise like when it comes to legal um, help we're we're really lucky that we've got a lot of offers for help as well so we do have a lawyer that helps us for free we have a webmaster who helps us for free until now almost all people work for us voluntarily so that that's really great but of course to (laughs) to even provide more for this mentorship program it would be good if we have some uh, resources but So if there's any uh, company that wants to get involved, they're really welcome. Yeah. You know, I know that all your services are for the UCI, current UCI riders, but you know, like I would like to join. Do you have a membership for non-current riders? Yeah. So you can make a donation, but uh, at the moment we've got that question quite a lot recently. So we're working on an affiliate membership so that you can join as a, as a member as well, if you aren't a, a rider. So yeah, that that's definitely. But that's something we learn while like while doing it, and it and it's great that people give us that kind of feedback. Well, you know, it, it's sort of like what we've talked about before: is that you do want to promote the sport, and this True. is certainly one way that I can do <laughs> I can do yeah. that without being yeah. a writer. And you know, I think yeah. this is such an important project that you're working on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. Very soon you can be uh, become an affiliate member. Excellent. And uh, and another struggle is I think uh, reaching out to the riders. Actually, on this moment we have ninety uh, members, which isn't so bad, but uh, it could be a bit more. I mean, our aim was like around hundred and fifty riders by the end of the season. So uh, we d- we did notice that you have like the early adapters, the riders who really see you know, share our vision and wants to join. And that's been a lot of the, like, top riders. And there are the riders that really need our help that joined. And then there's quite a big group of riders that are just a little bit, I wouldn't say lazy, but, you know, when we ask them, we say, hey, why didn't you sign up yet? They were like, oh, yeah, you know, I still need to do it. But, 
<laughs> yeah, I forget it every time. So, right. you know, we really have to go to the riders and explain them and say, okay, sign up. And uh, and then they'll do it because it's not that they don't want to sign up, but it's just a, a, that they're a bit slow. And then it's also a little bit, I think, a language barrier. So especially Italian and uh, Spanish riders, we communicate everything in, in English. And for the Dutch and the Germans, it's pretty easy. But for Italian and, and Spanish, it's a bit harder. So um, we, we do try to translate sometimes in, in multiple languages. But if you have to translate all your newsletters into five languages, it, mm. this takes a lot of time as well. So, right. yeah. One other thing that we just decided is to open up also for mountain bike CX, BMX, and track. So we want to help. And this was another question that that we learned while doing it from riders from different disciplines. Like they just asked, like, "Hey, can we join as well?" And first we thought, like, "Oh, we've got our hands full just on road cycling." But we also learned that there are so many. For example, we provide an improved standard contract for our members, and this is something uh, that's that's useful for every kind of rider if you're mm-hmm. a mountain biker or a track rider doesn't matter and the same is for the insurance or for the men- mentorship program so we're working on a sort of a separate commission now with helen wyman for example mm-hmm. a, uh, cx rider is helping us with that so yeah hopefully very soon we can yeah make that a bit more official mm-hmm. yeah we can sign up also members from other disciplines that'd be great adds to the pot <laughs> yeah yeah no i think in in general it's um i think it's just a very positive project and we we do get a lot of great responses and i just still feel like there's so much potential in women cycling and we we really try to change our sport in a positive way and make the riders start to realize they're the most important part of their sport and i think that's the most important that um you know, we women, we can be a little bit, I think, uh, yeah, we put ourselves a, a bit too much uh, on the background. <laughs> I don't know if that's, a, if that's an English expression, but you know what it I mean? It sure is. Yeah. Yes, I do know what you mean. Yes. Yeah. Speak up. Have a voice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, great. Well, thank you again so much for agreeing to this follow-up call and we'll stay in touch. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Talk to you soon. Ciao. Yep, ciao. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks to you for listening. Tell your friends about the podcast. Hear Her Sports was started to increase media coverage of female athletes and women in sport. 44% of athletes are women, yet only 4% of media coverage is about women. That's not a number. It's a rounding error. Spread the word about fantastic, strong women speaking up and doing amazing things. Please subscribe on iTunes and encourage people you know to do the same. It really does help more people to find the podcast. Thank you to Agnes Studio, the blog She Rides Her Bike, Gold Mines, and Leap Strategies for super support and partnership. I'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Bye-bye. Hey there, my name is Michael Laminato and this is Pit Pass F1, a brand new podcast that'll take you closer to the action of the world's most prestigious motorsport. From Monaco to Miami and Australia to Azerbaijan, Pit Pass F1 is on the ground and has you covered. Esteemed F1 journalists Julianne Serasoli and Chris Medland will take you inside the sport every round. They'll keep you up to date with the latest news breaking in Formula One and the most influential views shaping the world of Grand Prix racing. Every Friday, we'll be bringing you a track guide and race preview, and Chris and Drew will be in your feed every morning from Saturday through to Monday to keep you up to date on all the day's action on and off the track. So if you want to be in the know on the latest in Formula One, subscribe wherever you get your favourite podcasts and visit us at evergreenpodcasts.com. Pit Pass F1, a brand new show for Evergreen Podcasts.